Hello, smart friends, and welcome to day four for this week of the Smart City Podcast. In this episode of the Smart City Podcast, I interview Stephanie Piper, who is a 3D printing enthusiast and the community engagement coordinator at the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba, where she runs their makerspace. In this episode, we discuss Steph's journey from studying biomedicine and vaccine development to being involved in the 3D printing space and why she is so passionate about the possibilities and opportunities in 3D printing technology. Steph explains what 3D printing actually is and what kind of people and projects are happening in her makerspace, as well as some of the ways 3D printing can fit into the circular economy. Steph shares her passion for educating people about this technology and her views about integrating across the different disciplines. What we don't discuss in this episode is something that has happened for Stephanie since we recorded this interview back in September. Along with the team she formed at the Toowoomba startup Women's Weekend, Steph has started a business to help engage girls in STEM and to teach electronics in primary schools. It's called Spark Girls, and they were the winning team at the Toowoomba Startup uh, Weekend for Women, which then saw them head to the Asia Pacific Startup Weekend Women Finals in Bali a couple of weeks ago. And very excitingly, Spark Girls emerged as the winners in Bali as well. So that's such a wonderful achievement and just the beginning for this business. We'll post some links in the show notes if you want to know more about this and hopefully we can catch up with Steph again in the new year to hear more about how she's educating the next generation and encouraging girls to be engaged in STEM. But in the meantime, this is a great conversation about the possibilities of 3D printing and everything that goes along with that. So as always, I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. It's the Smart City Podcast, whoa, with smart city experts, here we go. Connecting smart technology, both big and small. Smart cities are making life better for all. Big data, emerging trends, self-driving cars and more. The Smart City Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Stephanie. How are you? Hey, I'm pretty good. How are you? That's good. Yeah, I am also very well. Um, let's jump straight into this. And Kelly, you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about. Yeah, sure. So I um, originally studied biomedicine, did my honours year in vaccine development. And during that time, I was just blown away with all the cool stuff that was going on in the 3D printing space. And I sort of said to myself, that is exactly where I want to be and that's where I want to go. And so I had to go at building my own 3D printer from a kit. That was the only way you could do it back then affordably. And um, I got put on a research team at QUT looking at 3D printable biodegradable scaffolds for implantation. And now what I do with myself is I'm the community engagement coordinator at the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba. And my job is to run the library makerspace, which I absolutely adore. Um, So I still get to follow my passion of working with 3D printing and I get to enjoy sort of sharing my passion with others in that space, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, cool. So what kind of sparked your interest in the smart city space? Yeah, so I've always yeah just been in love with the idea of electronics and, you know, making the machines do do their bidding for us. Like it's it really is like an advanced form of voodoo when you try to understand it. And I've always wanted to sort of get into it and really get a handle on how it works and try and teach people, you know, how how they can actually get involved with it. Yeah, cool, cool. So what is a smart city to you? Um, to me, a smart city is um, it's a place where like, it's, it's rigged out with enough sensors and enough inputs that it can really work for you. Um, so yeah, I'm particularly excited about the area of the circular economy and how we can, can really sort of make, make that useful to us in that sense. But yeah, there's so many great projects going on in this space, which which sort of makes me happy to see as well. Mm. So why do you think that this concept is so important? Um, it's important because we need to really keep progressing and keep growing in this space. We can't just sit back and stagnate and say, you know, this is, this is good enough. I feel like we really need to power forward and really make sure that we can help people as best we can with the technology that we can provide. And part of that, part of where I want to sort of sit in with all of this is making sure that people can understand the technology and feel confident in using it. Mm. Yeah, cool. 
So how do you think Australia is currently embracing the smart city concept? I've seen quite a few projects here and there that I'm sort of excited to to talk about anyway. Um, A friend of mine's working on a new project actually in New Zealand where they're fitting out all of the street poles with GPS sensors, which is pretty interesting. And they're doing that because of earthquakes over there. So if they know that the pole has moved, um, it shouldn't be something that normally moves. So they can do early earthquake detection and a whole bunch of other cool stuff with those sensors. I also really like the idea of the new LoRaWAN project, which is a, um, a low-power, high-range um, wireless networking system that will hopefully get implemented on a lot of rural Australian cattle stations and farms uh, where we can really start to like bring out the smart city ideas into the rural areas and really make sure that they can use those concepts to really work for them and make them work smarter. Like, for example, you could rig up more GPS sensors, for example, to all of your head of cattle, for example. And down the track, uh, if we end up doing more things with drone herding, you might be able to tell the drone, okay, let's herd all the third-year-old cattle you know, into this particular paddock. And it would know which cattle are the third years and it would ignore any that are one-year-old, for example, and it would herd them into that particular paddock using those smart sensors. Um, yeah, lots of great projects out there. I'm keen to sort of see how they pan out anyway. Yeah, definitely. So tell us about some of the things and projects that you um, are working on at the moment or have been working on in the past. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I'm really keen on my 3D printing and using that technology to do innovative and new things. I've sort of been really keen on the idea of exploring textiles with 3D printing recently Um, because not many people are looking at textiles meaningfully with the technology because most people that own a 3D printer for hobbyists' sake um, are guys. And, of course, textiles are usually a particularly feminine pursuit. And I feel like we have a lot of room to grow and explore in that area. I've also been really keen on the idea of developing 3D printable furniture. So designing modular pieces that can fit existing materials together um, to build new shapes and put together furniture cheaply that looks really good. Um, so I've written a blog about um, how I've done my latest furniture piece, which is a, a 3D printable stool. Um, that's up on my blog at piper3dp.com. And it sort of explores the idea of making sure that we can be able to like print these modular pieces on a standard size machine and combine them with dowel to make something that's really strong and functional. Mm. Cool. So you're at the university um, and you've got the makerspace there. I'm keen to hear, like, who are the types of people that come in and uh, make stuff or use the space? Um, We've had a lot of students come in and um, use the space for different sort of engineering coursework projects or even just their own projects. It's been great to see a lot of robotic style projects as well. Like um, one of the students is working on the InMove project which is super exciting. It's an open-source humanoid robot build where essentially the idea is you can start off by building a finger. It's just put together with 3D printed parts that you can just download. Um, It's assembled with tendon joints like um, fishing wire and a servo motor on one end. You can bend the finger backward and forth. And with that sort of simple concept, you can then move on and do a whole hand and then eventually a pretty much a half torso of a person which will be such a cool project um, if he finishes it off anyway. Uh, We've also unexpectedly had a lot of interest by the local community as well, which has been so fantastic to see. Like um, we've had about six retirees from the community coming into our meetups, uh, which has been awesome. And one of them has even built his own drawing machine off the display model one that we have in the Makerspace as well. Um, So it's been a good mix of people so far. Yeah, awesome. And I know that you do a lot um, outside the university trying to teach people uh, how to use 3D printers and that kind of thing to make it a bit more accessible. Um, how do you find, how do you do that? And, and how, and why do you think it's important that we, you know, start teaching um, kids to, you know, what's out there and what's possible with technology? Sure. Um- So I tend to find that like many of the classes, the people who attend them are often teachers and the scenario that they tend to find themselves in if they've come along to a 3D printing workshop is they've had enough budget or they've gotten some grant money from somewhere to buy a 3D printer, but 
it stayed in its box for a year and no one knows how to use it, which is so saddening to my soul to hear about. Um, so I feel like sometimes the technology goes too fast for us and especially for the average teacher or the average person to try and catch up with it. So I want to make sure that I can sort of share my knowledge and passion and ideas for what you can do with it and make make learning a lot more fun and easy for the teachers to embrace with the students. Um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of that teaching out at the Brisbane Hackerspace, which is um, a great place for it. Um, but I think, yeah, like it's so important to to learn digital fabrication skills because like there's just so much potential with what you can do with it. And we've just grown so much from the traditional manufacturing techniques that we had to originally employ. Like, for example, if you wanted to prototype something in plastic, you know, 20 or so or 30 years ago, what you'd have to do would be a hugely expensive, time-consuming process of injection molding. Um, so you'd have to get a mold cut. And, yeah, if you wanted to prototype that in plastic, um, yeah, that'd be super expensive. And it really is such a barrier to entry to most average people. And 3D printing just takes all of that away and means that you can sit down and, you know, design a 3D printable stool, design a new robot that you might want to try and try and test out, design anything pretty much under the sun, which is super exciting. I'm conscious that I, um, that some of the listeners maybe don't actually know what 3D printing is or digital um, fabrication. So can you give us the 101 on what 3D printing actually is? Yeah, great question. So 3D printing tends to work in such a way that you put in like a, a roll of plastic. Um, so it looks a bit like with a snipper cord to the average eye. You feed it in an extruder. It heats it up to about 200 degrees and it extrudes it out and yeah, it's a bit like a tube of toothpaste in that sense where it's extruding out this hot plastic and it's putting it down in layers and it's very precise with the way that the head can move to form different shapes. And so once you've got that first initial shape of the first layer down, it moves up about a third of a mil and then it does another layer. And by building up these layers, you can create your final object. Um, so that's 3D printing. There's, a, there's quite a few other different ways of digital fabrication that others might have heard of as well. Um, and those sort of involve your traditional subtractive manufacturing where you start with a block of something and you chip away to make your object. And 3D printing is a bit special because it is additive manufacturing in contrast where there's no material wastage. Um, it, you have pretty much a huge amount of freedom in what shapes you can create. Um, there's no slowing down for complexity. So you can get a high degree of complexity quite fast. And um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty nice technology. Yeah, cool. So can you um, change the, like the input? So like um, different materials and that kind of thing? You sure can. There's a huge amount of different materials that uh, we have access to now with 3D printing. Um, so your traditional sort of use case for many desktop machines that you might buy, like the sort of the cheap budget ones, so your hard plastics, but if you have a higher end machine, you can start to play with soft plastics. Um, so I've got a, a 3D printed wallet, um, which is made out mm. of soft plastics and also a 3D printed jacket as well. I've seen it. It's beautiful. And um, yep. you can also use a lot of exotic filaments as well, like wood fill, metal fill, um, you know, UV reactive, glow in the dark. There's so much cool stuff out there. Mm. And you said that you're interested in the circular economy. How do you see um, 3D printing fitting into that? Yeah, so ideally you would pair your 3D printer with a shredder and filament extruder or even bypass that completely and have a, a printer that runs directly from pellets. So ideally what you could do is you could 3D print out your object, use it for however long you like, and then once you're finished with it, um, it goes in the shredder and it gets shredded up to fine little plastic particles that you could then re-extrude and turn into more 3D printer filament. Um, so each time you do that, you do need a portion of virgin material because as a plastic, it's a polymer. And every time you heat up and cool down a polymer, it breaks its bonds, which makes it a little bit more brittle to work with in the sort of the non-molecular world. So you do need a, a bit of virgin material to make that process work. But in the long run, I feel like 3D printing certainly has its place in that way in the circular economy. 
can you see, um, and maybe it's already happened, I'm just out of it, but um, using, you know, plastic bottles or whatever um, as that uh, kind of source in uh, 3D printing? Yeah, sure. There's a fantastic startup in Western Australia that's doing that. Um, so they have collection bins at cool. many schools in Western Australia that you can go and put your bottles and they, they shred it down, turn it into filament and give it back to the schools free of charge which is a pretty mind-blowing service. And um, the guy that made it has a pretty inspiring story anyway. Like he had a, a Kickstarter campaign and on there, part of his story was that he found out that Western Australia, I think, has no recycling service. Like they have recycled bins, but what they do with the recycling is they sell it off on like the international market for rubbish, essentially, which third world countries tend to buy cheaply and use as a dirty energy source for, for you know, incinerating and generating electricity. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Let's talk about integration. Um, so, I mean, when we move into the smart city, we're going to have to integrate across different disciplines, governments, industries, and academia. So how do you think we can integrate better across all those different areas? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. Um, I think it's going to be a bit of a slow game, I think, integration across the board in that way. Um, but I'm sort of really excited anyway for like the integration, hopefully at the community level anyway, where like you have a lot of the different businesses locally, um, especially with like recycling of goods. I feel like there's a lot of potential for um, reducing need through sort of smart ways of working by sort of working with these community groups to reduce that. So I do a lot of work with the, the Brisbane Hackspace which is a 24-hour open community workshop. And it means that if you, you, know, if you don't have the tools to make something, um, you can go in there and use facilities to build whatever you like. Um, and it means that also if you are living in a city space and you, know, you don't want to make too much noise by you know, doing sanding all night or whatever you might want to do, you can come in and you know, not bother everyone with excessive amounts of noise. I feel like being able to, you know, stop that level of consumerism again with the, the circular economy idea. Um, I'd really love to see more of that concept being used in the smart cities sort of area, you know, like being able to post online somewhere or, you know, register a need for something and then have an app that sort of gives back to you, okay, you can either get that thing from the hackerspace or you can get it from the Brisbane Tool Library or you can pick up a recycled e-waste version of what you're trying to get from substation 33, or you could buy it from um, reverse garbage, you know, all these sort of different places. Mm. Yeah, cool. So you're going to develop that app now? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right after this. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, after that, teach me how to code. That'd be great. Um, I have one more question. No, I have two more questions. Okay, next question is... What do you think the emerging trends are that people aren't talking about? Yeah, I think people sort of haven't realized really a lot of the community efforts that are happening in this sort of space. Like I sort of dropped a few names before, but I'll elaborate on a few of those. Um, I really love the work that Substation 33 does in Logan. Um, like they honestly do a fantastic job um, at what they do. So they are primarily an e-waste recycling unit where you can go and drop off any of your e-waste that you do not want anymore for free, which is um, of itself a phenomenal service. Usually you might get charged an excessive amount of money to drop off recyclables, especially if you're a business, to like some other recycling center of a similar nature. They hire quite a lot of people in the community who um, are mentally disabled or physically disabled and would otherwise be unable to get work to help disassemble the e-waste. And they have a phenomenal hacker space inside as well where they can sort of take some of like the e-waste things that they've taken apart and turn them into new things. So they build their famous $66 3D printer that I think local schools with a low socioeconomic status can claim. And they also have um, a Philostruder as well, which is that mystical, magical machine that I sort of mentioned earlier that can turn plastic pellets or recycled plastic into more 3D printer filament. Um, yeah, I really admire the work they do out there. And I also really love as well, the work that um, Sabrina does at the Brisbane Tool Library as well on a similar vein. So she has started um, our own Brisbane Tool Library here where you can essentially get a membership and you can hire out any piece of equipment or tool that you might need 
um, rather than going and buying something and just letting it sit around in your shed unused for, you know, pretty much the whole year. So I'm particularly excited about the implications for the circular economy in these particular areas, like as well as with the, the Brisbane hackerspace. Um, and I feel like not many people know about them because they are so grassroots driven and so volunteer orientated that they don't have the big budget to advertise. You know, it's it, it really is just a word of mouth thing. Um, it is a bit of a, a well-kept secret sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, yes, 